Hello everyone and welcome back to week 6 of the free online course Introduction to Islamic Art at Safe Cultural Heritage Group. Today we will be talking about Orientalism and finish with a few remarks on contemporary Islamic art. Starting with Orientalism, let us first discuss what this word actually means. What do you associate with the so-called Orient? Most of the images that come to mind are based on European notions that are either romantic and exotic or dangerous, stylizing the Orient as the other. The word is actually derived from the Latin Sol Oriens or Rising Sun. The counterpart, the Occident, comes from Latin Sol Occidens or setting sun. So first and foremost, it is an indication of direction. But the term acquired a range of meanings in the 19th and early 20th centuries because of historical and geopolitical changes. What was considered as the Orient? The whole of Asia, Arab countries, the Ottoman Empire, Southeastern Europe, Africa and partly also Spain. This was mostly connected to the Muslim religion. Today, Europeans would probably group the Middle East, the Arab Islamic world and Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan and North Africa together as Oriental. The so-called Oriental studies as an academic discipline were created dealing with archaeology, arts, languages or culture in general of the Orient. This was often bridged by Western archaeological expeditions that spread across the Middle East and Asia, for example to Assyria or Mesopotamia. Many of these archaeological finds were brought back to Europe and are now displayed in museums. These campaigns were mostly driven by colonialist initiatives and imperialist attitudes from the 18th and 19th centuries. Hence, they have become negatively connotated. Basically, it is said that it is the Western study of the East and a prejudiced interpretation of the countries imagined under this umbrella term as exotic. Today, the former Oriental studies have been renamed as Asian studies, among other names. Like we have discussed with the term Islamic art in the beginning, the term Orient is too vague and became historically charged with imperialist values. As such, it is no longer used in scholarship, except when referring to the frequently discussed term Orientalism. In 1978, the literary scholar Edward Said published the seminal book Orientalism, a comprehensive study and highly influential even until now, especially in the field of post-colonial studies. He argues that Orientalism is a Western invention, an institu institutionalized construct and a powerful discourse that has as a basis the fundamental distinction between an enlightened and progressive Occident and an exotic yet retrograde Orient. His thesis are that Orientalism is connected to imperialist power politics, that it creates the picture of a superior Europe and that it perpetuates stereotypes characterizing the so-called oriental culture as inferior and static. I quote, Orientalism enables the political, economic, cultural and social domination of the West, not just during colonial times, but also in the present. 
It is important to note that he only refers to the Islamic Arab countries and not, for example, to India, China, Japan, and other Far Eastern countries. Also, he excludes German Orientalist studies and only talks about the British, French, and the US colonial powers. Said traces the scholarship related to the discourse on the Orient in the 19th and 20th centuries. As such, it is not a comprehensive history of Orientalism, but a good starting point for anyone interested in the subject. Of course, this book is also seen as controversial and is still widely discussed. Said also published essays later in which he amended some mistakes he admitted to have made. For example, Orientalism Rediscovered in 1985. While Said is not primarily concerned with the visual arts, the so-called Orientalist paintings clearly express how the Orient was viewed by the West. Said explains that the West created the Orient as a counter image as the other, also in order to construct a European self. This means that the so-called Orient did not establish itself or refer to itself as Orient. It becomes the opposite of Western civilization, which can only mean exotic and dangerous. Said identified two connotations with the Orient, sexuality and violence, which play a central role in Oriental fantasies. This includes, for example, violent warriors and scantily clad or naked women in the harem, or also young boys, this painting is the cover picture of his book, which Said even refers to in his study. It was created by the French painter Jean-Léon Jérôme in the second half of the 19th century, and it is called Snake Charmer. When Linda Nochlin refers to the imaginary Orient in her famous essay, she talks about this painting and whether it should be considered as a, I quote, visual document of 19th century colonialist ideology in would-be transparent naturalism. She raises the question of why it is titled Snake Charmer when there is a larger audience that is not mentioned, likely because our attention should be drawn solely to the young boy in the foreground with his back to us, a snake around his torso. To the right, an elderly man is playing the flute, before them, in the background, sits an audience in nomadic garb. They are propped up against a tiled wall densely filled with blind niches and arcades, with inscription cartouches above and a larger one with pseudo-inscription at the very top. We see reflected many of the aspects we've already talked about. Tiles, monumental inscriptions, pointed arches with geometric and floral ornament, arabesques, and the turquoise color we frequently saw. The tiles are likely even actual Isnik wear that the painter saw during his travels, and he actually painted this work in then called Constantinople, today's Istanbul. There are garments and a rug that a European audience would recognize as Oriental. It is a rather mysterious atmosphere and the actual performance is not revealed to us viewers. It incorporates mystery, exoticism and, to some extent, sexualization or fetishization. It has also been criticized for its picturesque portrayal of a timeless static world with its rituals, without any Western viewers such as the painter himself would have been. The latter are only present through their gaze that coincidentally shapes this Orientalist pseudo-reality. If we briefly turn towards the female body that tends to be sexualized in Orientalist painting, we have here another work of Jerome's called The Terrace of the Seraglio from 1898. Again, we have an architectural backdrop 
specific garments and a large rug, and nudity. We see here an actual place, the Revan kiosk in the Topkapi Sarai, the palace of the Ottoman sultans. It is very likely that the painter visited this place, as he is known for having made sketches during his travels. But he would have never seen ladies bathing in the pool. We also have a musician turning his back to us and an audience of women. A eunuch clad in a blue scarf is standing behind them. These seem to be stereotypical figures, the painter situated in this fountain side of the kiosk that is luxuriously decorated with green marble and porphyry columns and walls with blue and green tiles and golden calligraphy. Some other painters did not create an Orientalist scenery, but only used props or attributes to convey an aura of mysticism and exoticism, like with the Grand Odalisque, an 1814 painting by French artist Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingré. The word Odalisque is derived from the Ottoman Odalik, which means roommate, and refer to harem ladies working as servants to the sultan's wives. We can see the precious fabrics, the jewelry, and a pipe to the right. Before her, an Ottoman belt buckle is draped, as if she'd just taken off her clothes. The turban and the fan in her hand complete the picture. And again, we have a rear view of this lady who is lasciviously draped on the bed. Of course, there are also other themes that include genre scenes set in specific localities, often including buildings or ruins and busy street life, like to the left this Ivan with the two minarets and the domes in the background and its densely tiled surface. The people are colorfully clad. Or even more intimate scenes like The Woman of Algier by Delacroix in the middle. We see the highly decorative interior, various different textiles and garments juxtaposed, different objects like the hooker in the foreground and the woman to the right shown in the rear, who is likely the servant of the seated ladies. Or this, or this street scene from Cairo on the right, called the lantern maker's courtship, with the background of a busy marketplace, but foregrounding this intimate interaction between the pair. Another important medium, apart from painting, is photography from the 19th century onwards, especially in the context of Orientalism. Photographs were also constructions of a pseudo-realism, as photography promised to depict the truth. As such, it aided in stereotyping the Orient. Photographs frequently included the harem, figures sitting together and drinking, smoking the hookah or belly dancers, and both scantily clad and veiled figures. But these are not actually realistic representations, but specifically curated pictures mediated through a European lens. As such, it is clear that photography took inspirations from Orientalist painting in the stage sets but also that paintings incorporated notions of this new mode of capturing what was perceived as real. For studying these relationships in the historical and socio-political context, Orientalism can be studied as an aesthetic prerogative rather than only an imperialist and colonialist power discourse. Conversely, photography was utilized by, for example, the Iranian Qajar dynasty for the imperial propaganda, postulating the ruler as a modernist figure imbued with dynastic power. The Shah also borrowed from the Orientalist traditions of photography, for example, for more intimate pictures of his wives, while public photography consolidated internal power structures. Let us stop here and briefly talk about contemporary arts in the Islamic world. 
Due to globalization, many diaspora artists also work from Europe, the UK or the US, among others. Again, this is not a classification I am postulating, but simply a broad frame of reference for all the arts related to countries in which Islam is the dominant religion or artists with a background from these countries. To give a brief glimpse into the artistic output of one specific region, I chose Pakistan. Here we have a long tradition of miniature painting from the Mughal dynasty, which is the subject of a range of artists like Shasya Sikandar, Rashid Rana and Imran Qureshi. In Pakistan, there was a 20th century movement called Neo Miniature Painting, which used Mughal miniatures as inspirations for their works. For example, on how to structure the composition or perpetuating traditional figure types. One of the artists wanting to break with tradition in her own terms is Shasya Sikander, a Pakistani American visual artist using a variety of media, often to deliberately disrupt the nostalgia for the past. Here to the right is one famous artwork called Pleasure Pillars from 2001. She incorporates South Asian syncretic heritage to construct narratives, contrasting abstraction and figuration. This work has to be visually decoded. You have three pillar-like zones. Two narrow ones on the sides show female dancers from a Mughal Pachanama, the chronicle of the Emperor Shah Jahan, here to the left. These figures are enlarged and gain more importance than in their original context, where they are confined to the bottom. At the bottom left, you can see a popular passionate motif of a lion eating a gazelle. The central pillar shows a woman's face with Capricorn-like horns. The connected red and blue hearts may emphasize the combined knowledge of painting tradition, juxtaposing antique Greco-Roman and Indian heritage. There is also play with ornament that is laden with meaning. For example, the fighter jets at the bottom, which form an aesthetic rosette. Looking at another artist named Rashid Rana, we see a different play with miniature painting traditions. Here you see a pixelated square or pixelated squares like a grid subverting tradition and using digital photography to show a Mughal portrait. Another artist is Imran Qureshi, who creates self-portraits in the Mughal miniature style, almost stylizing himself as an emperor and finding interesting ways to include contemporary aspects. However, the calligraphic arts by themselves are also incorporated in contemporary Pakistani art, such as in the oeuvre of Tazim Qayyum, who creates calligraphic artworks during her performances. As a Pakistani-Canadian conceptual artist, she also works with various media and explores different topics, among others her own Muslim identity. She often uses the cockroach as a symbol or metaphor of the loss of life. She often draws them in text pieces shaped like concentric circles, here to the right, also including lines of text in Urdu, her mother tongue, to the left. Lastly, let us quickly compare a museum space with a gallery space. We can see that in the museum space, to the right, there is an interesting mix between traditions, such as official documents together with science, calligraphy and painting traditions inspired from Western art. Of course, museums also include sociopolitical contemporary photography and installations and many other media. If you have a look at the gallery website to the left, we see again the miniature painting tradition in the middle with this half shown horseman together with numerous works of calligraphy in bright colors and harmonious compositions. 
please keep in mind that these images also reflect a personal selective choice and that there are many other subjects and media used, like sculptures or installations, or even the more intangible performance arts. Do visit those websites and discover the complexity and variety of contemporary art by yourselves. I hope you enjoyed today's lecture. I try to give an overview on the topic of Orientalism and the brief glimpse into what contemporary Islamic art may entail, focusing on a small group of Pakistani artists specifically. Thank you very much for listening. Check out the online classroom for assignments and notifications and make sure to listen to the lectures of week one to five. Bye bye.